I'm a big YouTuber. I literally cover court cases for a living. I cover the court cases for a living. Yeah, what up, y'all? Welcome to Crown TV. I am the Crown Prince. Shout out to the royal fam, man. We done leveled up. We putting the petty things away. Hashtag royal fam in the comments if you hear me. If you want to donate to the channel and help us grow, you could do that through the Super Chat or the Cash app. Let's get it. Yeah, what up, y'all? Welcome back to Crown TV. I am the Crown Prince. If you do not know, welcome back to another quick hit. If I look exhausted, y'all, it's because I am exhausted. I got people hitting me up from the UK. Every 20 minutes, they want these closing arguments. Ab is very big in the UK, by the way, if you don't know. I cannot go to sleep knowing that there are people out there staring at their phones, hitting the refresh button. My conscience won't let me do it. I had to get this information. I had to go gather it. And I had to put it together just to make this video. So I hope y'all appreciate it. Uh, we're going to get right into it so I can get right out of it and go to sleep. Everybody is harping over uh, Braz's lawyer's testimony. I get it. He, he did an amazing job. He did an amazing job on these closing arguments. But I don't think that the other lawyers are getting enough credit. All of these lawyers did an amazing job with these closing arguments. I think that A.R. Abs lawyer's defense of him was very telling i don't think that ar ab expects to walk out of this without doing any time he's attacking very specific things not everything the big thing that he did not attack was taz and i don't think that this has to do with with that particularly but i don't think that any of these lawyers in general are worried about taz's testimony braz's lawyer tore into Taz and we're gonna get to that in a minute um but and when we, when we get to it you'll understand why I say that the other thing that he did not challenge was the drugs he kind of admitted to selling crack he admitted to selling cocaine but he wanted to get away from the meth he completely denied any uh association with the meth in this case in fact all of these defendants lawyers uh, wanted to get their clients away from this meth specifically now the next lawyer was brand uh jamal blanding's lawyer and he drove home how flimsy this case is against jamal blanding the big thing about jamal blanding is that they got him on all of these trips they keep talking about all of these trips it's like the main thing them following him on a plane back and forth to California, Jamal Blanding's lawyer pointed out that the only pictures they have of Jamal Blanding in California are either at the studio or the hotel. Those are the only pictures they have. He also pointed out that these duffel bags that they keep talking about Jamal Blanding carrying, they never made it back to Philly. These duffel bags were never spotted in Philly, so the dots are not connecting. And in fact, they have no evidence tying Jamal Blanding to any drugs except for uh, some small amounts of marijuana. So now you can see why they have been trying to admit all of this bogus uh, evidence from social media, these pictures of people wearing T-shirts. It's because they need all of that. They need everything they can to try to make these cases, some of them, not flimsy. Now, next was Shadi's lawyer. Uh, the first thing he did was dro was dug into the title of OG. And, you know, they keep mentioning that people were, certain people were being called OG. He tore into that and how in urban environments, um, older, elder people, Pretty much anybody are called OG. So he laid that out pretty well. And then here's where the great lawyering comes in on his part. He dug into reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is so important. So he dug into reasonable doubt. He spent a considerable amount of time on this reasonable doubt thing. Johnny Cochran style. Uh, he drilled them on it. He made sure they understood it. Uh, be in the courtroom beyond a reasonable doubt. Everything has to be 
beyond a reasonable doubt. Not 90%, not 95%. Everything has to be 100% or you have to come back with that not guilty verdict. He did a great job at delivering this message. Um, if you can put that in a juror's head, if you could drill that into a, a juror's head and have them go into deliberations with that on their mind, you have a win. Now we're going to talk about the talk of the day, and that is Braz, Hans Gadsden's lawyer. These are some words that people use to describe Braz's lawyer. Charismatic, energetic, clear, concise, confident, a brilliant storyteller, a beast. Now, he started off, and this is the first thing he said. He's talking to the jurors. He says the feds say they had an army of agents on this case. He said, what are our chances of beating an army? Well, in this case, extremely good. So the person that was in the courtroom said as soon as they heard that, they knew what, what, was, what was about to happen, and they knew some bombs was about to drop. He addressed the racial makeup of the jury without making the jury uncomfortable. Y'all got to remember, he's addressing a jury of people who are not from our environment. So he did that by using his charisma to tell these stories and connect and connect everything. So the one story that he told was about how back in the days when they wanted to find out if somebody was guilty, what they would do is tie that person up and throw them in a river. And they believed that if that person floated to the top, it was the impurities in that person that made him float it to the top and they were judged as guilty. Uh, he used that to point out that times have changed and we have a different way of doing things now. We have what is called a justice system. And this justice system is based on facts. It is a very specific way of doing things. So he's drawn this comparison of the crazy way that they used to judge people and figure out if they were guilty to the way we judge people now by what they look like, what color they are, how they how they talk, how they act, their gender, their sex. So he did a very good job of connecting that message without making the jury uncomfortable, which is super important. You don't want them thinking you're trying to make this into a race thing. You, you just don't want that. Uh, he pointed out that their job is to look at the facts and be objective. Um, he, he also used his charisma to mock the feds over this OG thing. So he's telling these stories, and he's telling stories about his grandfather. And he's like, yeah, my grandfather's an OG, and this is a white guy. And he's talking about himself and, you know, how old he is and, you know, how he grew up and it was back in the days and he goes you know i'm a og so after that he tore into taz and this is the big part and i told y'all this was going to come up the weed thing y'all remember i told y'all that taz was on the stand and every time the prosecution needed him to remember something he remembered the time the date what some what people had on he remember every single detail that the prosecution needed him to remember and when he got when the defense cross-examined him he couldn't remember anything and he used the excuse that he smoked too much weed Braz's lawyer blew him up for that um he he pointed out that Taz said that he remembered Braz from one of these OB, OBH locations from over a year ago. And he basically said, like, why would you even listen to that from somebody who told you they smoke 30 blunts a day and they can't remember what happened yesterday? So he tore into him for a minute on a weed thing. And then he also tore into him on the murder thing. Uh, not really on a murder thing, but he basically was saying, listen, man, they brought a serial killer up in here. That's how thirsty they are to tie these people to these drugs, that they are willing to let a serial killer 
uh, walk out of here free. You're not going to walk out free. But that they are willing to let a serial killer uh, walk in here and lessen his time to tie these people to these drugs. And that's how thirsty they are. Um, that's pretty much it. That's not it. It was a much longer uh, thing. But if I did the whole closing argument, we would be here all day. And I ain't got all day. I'm tired, y'all. I hope y'all appreciate that, especially the people in the UK. I hope y'all satisfied. I love y'all. Peace. Join the Crown TV community on the Band app and get instant access to the Crown TV calendar, daily news updates, all documents and court paperwork as it is released. This means you will get it here first. New video and live stream alerts and more. And that is all for free on the Band app. On a Friday night at 9 o'clock, hundreds of kids who don't have to be here. You'd think this would be the last place they'd want to be. But here in Newark, they're in here because of what's out there. Anything that keeps me off the street, I do. Like, besides, besides doing anything wrong, like selling drugs and all that stuff, I'm not into that. If I come here, I will see, like, friendly faces. Gun violence, like, out there, they fighting, getting shot. <laughs> Inside the walls of Westside High, every Friday night until 11 p.m., it's a space free of fear. Within these walls, kids can shoot pool, play video games, hit the hardwood, practice cheers, or even lay down track in a recording studio. Within these walls, they can laugh. It's called the Lights On program, now in its fourth year, and it's open to everyone. Nadia Camacho graduated in 2008. If it was around back then, I think that we wouldn't have lost um, so many of my classmates. Like, if we have a class reunion now, a lot of my classmates wouldn't be there. I haven't lost any more kids to gun violence since we started doing the school year. Principal Akbar Cook says you can't ignore the results. If you remember him, that's because last summer, Eyewitness News told you about a free laundry room he installed in school. Students bullied because of dirty clothes, resulting in chronic absenteeism. Principal Cook says there's been a 10% increase in daily attendance since. I was finding out just from being a principal that the kids don't eat during the weekends. They also serve hot meals to kids on Friday nights. During the summer, they do this three nights a week. It's all made possible by donations from the community and a Alumni. It's kind of amazing what a school can become when people care about kids who just want a chance.